Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on electromagnetism to optics. This is video number 8 and specifically I'm going to discuss Maxwell's equations. So this is by far and away the most important video in this section. The previous sections to this which are relevant uh, are the sections where I discuss Maxwell's equations, electrostatics and magnetostatics. So really what I'm trying to do in this current video is sum up all of the work in the past. For that reason it might be slightly uh, longer than most of my other videos but that's unavoidable. In this section on electromagnetism to optics there are seven previous videos. In the first two I discussed how we use x plus or minus v times t in order to represent a traveling wave. I discussed the wave equation. Furthermore I discussed harmonic or sinusoidal waves and that's where we use cosine and sine to represent a wave. Thereafter, I moved on to a complex exponential representation for waves. And finally, in video number 7, I discussed the group and phase velocities. So the online reference I'd like to give you for this is www.maxwells-equations.com. This isn't my website, my website is universityphysicstories.com, but I think this is a useful reference, particularly the introduction page, which has also an introductory video and the author is trying to give a, an intuitive understanding and I think that's uh, something he uh, achieves. Before we begin I need to give you a, a caveat and the caveat is you can't discuss properly Maxwell's equations without employing vector calculus. The whole subject of classical electromagnetism and uh, quantum, uh, quantum um, electromagnetism requires vector calculus and quite heavy and substantial vector calculus. So what I'm attempting to do here is have a minimum of vector calculus. Obviously I have to write down some of the equations, but I'm going to really give a hand-waving argument. Towards the end of the video I will uh, cease talking about Maxwell's equations and for those who are, we'll say, beginning um, optics or electromagnetism, that'll be the end of the video. But I'm also thereafter going to employ some reasonably um, uh, concrete vector calculus to discuss radiation and the Coulomb and Lorentz gauges. Just before we begin, I'd like to give you some of my own video references. I have three sections which are relevant, the vector calculus for electromagnetism section, the electrostatic section, and the magnetostatics section. So if you're looking at the uh, video here and you're saying, well, I'd like to know a bit more about one of the things I discuss, well, you can check these particular videos out and you can see uh, a bit more detail, a hell of a lot more detail, in fact. So let's, let's get going. The first thing I'd like to discuss is the causes or cause of electromagnetism. Stationary and moving electric charges produce electric fields. So I have an electron, for example, if it's stationary it produces an electric field. Of course, if it's moving it also produces an electric field. But a moving electric charge, let's say a moving electron, also creates a magnetic field. So we call, we, we call moving electric charges currents. So that means that a stationary electric charge will just have an electric field, but will not have a magnetic field. A moving electric charge will have both a, an electric field and a magnetic field. So the concept of fields, I'm, I'm sure, is nothing new to you. And it, I'd just like to illustrate that at the bottom left of your screen. Let's say we have a positron, so a positive charge electron, or what we call a positron, a positron represented by the orange circle. The electric field moves radial, radially outwards from positive charges, represented by the purple arrows. Now, here the electric field is going to be non-zero because it is a stationary charge, and it is a charge, has to have an electric field. But because it's stationary, the magnetic field is, in, in fact, zero. Let's consider now, at the very bottom of your screen, a moving electric charge, in this case a moving positron. So it's moving from left to right, so it was here, and it's moving towards here, we'll say. And what I've drawn, instead of drawing the electric field with these arrows, what I've done is I've drawn uh, surfaces, or in this case, circles of equal potential or equal magnitude of the, of the field. So that's one value of the potential, another value is here, and another value is here. So we call those equipotential surfaces. What we can see is an actual fact that instead of the, if it was stationary, you might draw the, the equipotentials might look like this, and they would be concentric circles. 
but if the charge is moving we don't have these concentric circles and instead we have the circles uh, they seem to be packed at the uh, front of the movement but they are not packed or they are loose at the back so that is what the electric field for a moving charge might look like the magnetic field will be non-zero and that's represented by this blue these blue circles here the magnetic field will circle around a current or, or the phrase is it'll curl around a current and we will discuss how we work out the direction of the magnetic field later on and that is using the right hand rule now in the study of electromagnetism there are lots of different uh, quantities with different of course placeholders which can perhaps confuse you so I'd just like to give you a bit of a, a, a library here or a dictionary and that's on the right hand side of your screen so of course E is the electric field and B is the magnetic field now some authors might say that they might always talk about H being the magnetic field and I'm going to tell you that they they're not actually being um, they're not really being fair to you because H is not the magnetic field it's what's known as the auxiliary field and it's basically where we take into account the magnetization of an object so it's whereas the, the magnetic field B has no magnetic polarization or no uh, no magnetization the auxiliary field does now let's be let's be honest if we're talking about real life situations we will always have some form of magnetization and it's for that reason most people will talk about H uh, the auxiliary field but realistically the auxiliary and magnetic fields are slightly different. In a similar fashion, the electric field is E, and we have something called the displacement current, D. And the difference there is the displacement current or displacement field takes into account electric polarization. I don't really want to get into what polarization means, but it, it's, it's really where there is a physical uh, change in your substance due to an applied magnetic field or electric field. And the, the way the substance changes creates its own field, which we would call the polarization field. Capital Q is a sum of charges, or you might have small q. Small q might be a single charge, and if you take the sum of all the small charges, you would get the total charge, capital Q. Charge density is as you would imagine, so it's the it charge density rho, and that's just going to be the total charge divided by the volume. That's going to be the charge density. Current is given by capital I. Now current will have a direction. So really current is a vector. Sometimes people don't bother writing in the vector uh, nature of current and just leave it as, as I. Current density is exactly what it says in the 10. It is the uh, the current per unit volume, or sorry, it's the current per unit area. It's actually um, amps per meter squared. Now I said earlier on that we couldn't discuss or we cannot discuss electromagnetism and Maxwell's equations without having a small bit of vector calculus. So the three most important uh, symbols are first of all the Nabl operator here and then two operations which the Nabl operator can do. It can take the divergence of a vector field and the vector field in this case is just represented by the question mark or it can take the curl of the vector field. Now if you want to know exactly how you perform that Look at my videos on vector calculus for electromagnetism. But where you see this dot or scalar product symbol, you look, you're talking about the divergence. And when you see this cross product symbol, we're talking about the curl. Now you might ask yourself, well, why are they called that? It's pretty obvious, actually. Because the physical interpretation of the curl is it, is it, it, it uh, tries to measure the rotation of a, of a vector field and the divergence tries to measure measure the divergence of a field so how much of a source or a sink that the field is so with this library I think we're, we're all set to begin discussing Maxwell's equations at a risk of frightening you off I'm going to immediately show you what the, the equations themselves look like and don't worry I won't be getting into too much detail in this regard so first of all, there are four Maxwell equations, and they are, they are as follows. We have on the top left of your screen, Gauss's law for electric fields. We have on the bottom left of your screen, Gauss's law for magnetic fields. We have on the top right of your screen, Faraday's law for electromagnetic induction. And on the bottom right of your screen, we have what's known as Ampere's law. Now, if you look closely, you can see that we're able to write, or have written these equations using 
integrals and also using uh, what's known as the differential form. And in order to go from your integral form to your differential form, you use two very important vector calculus theorems on the bottom right of your screen, known as Stokes' theorem or Green's theorem. And I'm not going to discuss them, but it, it's just for your, your own information that there are two ways to write any of these equations, either in the integral or the differential form. And you move between your integral and differential forms using Stokes' theorem or Green's theorem. So I think it's useful to read them. So how would you actually read these equations? Let's look at Gauss's law for the electric field. So this is the closed surface integral. I, I use the notation with S in the bottom, meaning it's a surface integral, rather than having, let's say, a double integral. Often people, would, for a volume integral, will write a triple integral. I think it's more convenient just to give a single subscript, S or V, and only write one integral. So this would be the closed surface integral of the dot product between the electric field and the infinitesimal area element dA. And that's equal to the total charge enclosed divided by epsilon zero. That's just a constant, it's called the permittivity of free space. So look, it's a constant, it's, it's not a big deal. Using uh, the theorems in the bottom right of your screen, we're able to convert this into in its uh, differential form. And as you can see, it looks a hell of a lot neater in its differential form. And we would read this as the divergence of E is equal to rho, the charge density over epsilon zero. Now, if we apply our electric field to a substance and it has some sort of electric polarization, then we must, instead of using the electric field, we talk about the displacement field. And we can rewrite Gauss's law using the displacement field here, that the divergence of D is rho free. Rho is the, it's the free charge, or the charge which is available to move around your system. So that's how you would read Gauss's law for electric fields. If I want to read uh, Gauss's law for magnetic fields on the bottom left of the screen, I would say it's the closed surface integral of B dot dA is equal to zero, B the magnetic field with the scalar dot product with the infinitesimal surface area element. And let's be honest, we usually integrate along a sphere. So uh, it would be the infinitesimal area element of a sphere. Converting that to a differential form, we see that the divergence of B is equal to zero. And this is, you might say that's very simple. What's the point of having it? I can tell you that that single equation here, that the divergence of B is equal to zero, tells us that there are no magnetic monopoles, or there are no magnetic charges. That, of course, is in contrast to the electric charges, because we, of course, have electrons and positrons. We don't have a single uh, magnetic charge. On the top right of your screen, we have Faraday's law for electromagnetic induction. And this is it, it probably the, the most useful in terms of everyday life. Here we have the closed line integral of E dot dl, dl being the infinitesimal line segment, is equal to minus the, uh, the surface integral of the time rate of change of B dot dA. Notice we have this dt term, and that's very important. Uh, because it's this dt term which in actual fact gives rise to electromagnetic fields and light. This can be written as the curl of the electric field is minus del b del t. So I'll tell you straight out what this means is that a time varying magnetic field gives rise to an electric field. And Faraday's law is, is the basis upon which all of our electricity is generated. And finally on the bottom right of your screen you have, you have Ampere's law. Uh, the most complicated looking of the lot. Ampere's law says that the closed line integral of b dot dl is equal to mu zero times the current. Mu zero is a constant, it's called the permeability of free space. And that really is the, the it's, it's a, a measure of how easily magnetized your object is. We have to add to that mu zero epsilon zero, and we have the integral of the time rate of change of the electric field dotted with the infinitesimal surface area element. Once again, we can rewrite this using our Stokes and Green's theorem. And that is a much simpler way of writing it. The curl of B is mu zero J times mu zero epsilon zero del E del T. J is the current density. And we can finally rewrite this in terms of the auxiliary field if we have magnetization or our object is after getting magnetized. So those are the four Maxwell equations mathematically defined. And I hope I haven't lost you because I'm actually going to discuss what they physically mean now. 
So just to recap on the difference between the electric field and the displacement current. On the top left of your screen, dielectrics are influenced by applied electric fields and they become what's known as polarized. And the polarization has its own electric field and what's what we call bound charge. So this is the charge making the polarization field, but it can't move around and constitute a current. But because we have an applied field and uh, an induced field, we have to basically look at the total field. And it's useful to define the displacement current here, D is equal to epsilon zero E, which is the, po the applied field, plus the polarization field, capital P. And if we do that, we find that we have a new version of Gauss's law for electric fields, which looks quite neat. And this is um, because now it, Gauss's law only depends on the free charges, and we control the free charges. We can convert that into integral form on the bottom left of your screen. Something similar happens with the magnetic field. All objects, of course, are influenced by applied external magnetic fields, and they become polarized. We call the magnetic polarization magnetization. And the magnetization causes its own magnetic field and not just bound, not bound charges, but bound currents. In other words, they're currents inside the object, but are, they're not, we can't control them. And because we have an applied magnetic field and an induced magnetic field, we talk about the total magnetic field. We call that the auxiliary field H. And if we define the auxiliary field H like this, we're able to rewrite for the curl, or if if you just if you want to go back here, we're talking about uh, we're talking about Ampere's law. We're able to rewrite Ampere's law just in terms of the free current density, and we can control free current in the laboratory, and that's why often we use H. And I've written it in in, in integral form in the bottom right of your screen. Now the, the concept of flux is inherent in the study of electromagnetism and Maxwell's equations. Let's define it. Flux is the flow of something, usually a fluid, and it's through a body's surface. So we're talking about electric and magnetic fields. So the flux of electric or magnetic field is the, the, uh, the flow. Now I'm, I'm going to give it on the top left of your screen, I'm just going to give it inverted commas because you know, it's it's really a theoretical argument to say the field is actually flowing. So you have to try and imagine this. Let's say we have a field given by this capital F here, and the field is going to the right as you look. It's going through a rectangular surface element here. And dA is the infinitesimal surface area element. So if the flow is perpendicular to the surface through which it's flowing, you're going to have a maximum flow or a maximum flux. Conversely, if the, uh, if the field is parallel to the surface to which you want it to flow, you would say there's going to be zero flux. So if you can imagine rain hitting off your window, if the rain is coming perpendicular to the window, you're going to have a maximum flux or attempted flux of rain through your window. But if the rain is falling straight down or parallel to your window, you're going to have a minimum flux and you'll have you'll have almost zero, let's say, raindrops on your window. Now what happens if the flux or the flow is at, a, at an angle, or the field is at an angle to your surface area element? Well, of course, we're going to break it down into a parallel and a perpendicular component using sine and cosine. The perpendicular component of that is going to involve the cosine. The placeholder we give for phi, or excuse me, for flux is phi. So we say the infinitesimal flux element is d phi, and that's going to be the product of the field and the cosine of theta. So that will give us the amount of the field which is flowing perpendicular to the surface area element and is actually giving us a flux. Of course, if we want to calculate the total flux, we just integrate this, and we say that the total flux, capital phi, is the surface integral of f the field dot dA. So if you wanted to calculate the flux of your electric field, what you would do is you do the close you do the excuse me the open surface integral of e dot dA. E dot dA would give the flux of the electric field. This leads us straight into Gauss's law for electric fields. 
Gauss's law of electric fields dictates how the electric field behaves around electric charges. I've rewritten it in integral form on the middle left hand side of your screen. We have the closed surface integral of e dot dA and that's equal to the total charge enclosed by whatever surface you take divided by the constant epsilon zero, the permittivity of free space. Notice what really is written on the left hand side is in English the flux through your volume. Now when I say it's through your volume we're taking a surface area they were taking the surface area of your volume. So uh, that's why I suppose it's volume. So Gauss's law is a mathematical statement that says that the total flux exiting a volume is proportional to the charge inside. The reason it's proportional is because we have this epsilon zero constant. If that wasn't there it would be exactly equal to the total charge. Now let's say for example we had a positive charge on its own here and whatever way symmetry allowed us, we could come up what's known as it with a Gaussian surface. So we choose a surface, we choose the appropriate infinitesimal surface area element, and we apply Gauss's law to calculate the total charge enclosed. Some of the neater uh, or, um, uh, uses of this are when we can choose a cubic Gaussian surface, and what really what what will happen then is you literally just you get the area of one of your sides. Let's say if you wanted to calculate the flux going to the right, you would get the total flux, which is the total area, and divided by, in this case, one eighth, because each face would have one eighth of the flux, because there are eight surfaces. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six surfaces, isn't it? Yes, six. <laughs> Excuse me. So, ignoring that slip of the tongue, let's continue. So, electric charges are the sources of the electric field. We said this a moment ago, it's also, they are also the sources of the magnetic field, or moving charges are. Now, converting Gauss's law for electric fields from its integral to its differential form, we get that the divergence of the electric field is rho the charge density divided by epsilon zero. We call this, like I said, the divergence of the electric field. So this calculates, or this measures, the, the uh, tendency of the field to diverge away from the uh, source. So for positive charges, the, defi the field wants to go, it wants to diverge away from positive charges. On the opposite end, for negative charges, the field wants to converge at that. So you'd say positive charges is maximum divergence, whereas negative charges of maximum convergence. And this is really like a source. So sources will have maximum divergence and sinks will have maximum converge convergence. So if you think about water flowing into the sink in your kitchen, well then this, the, the sinkhole itself has got maximum convergence and all of, the, all of the flow of water is converging at that point. Something similar happens with negative electric charges. Now, looking at this equation, it implies that divergenceless fields will have no sources because the divergence of the field is directly proportional to whatever sources there are of the field. This brings us to Gauss's law for magnetism. Gauss's law for magnetism says that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. That's the second of Maxwell's equations. And this means that there are no magnetic charges. And this is in stark contrast to Gauss's law for electric fields because of course we know that there are electric charges. We have the electric charge density here, rho. We don't have a similar argument with magnetic fields. So this means that magnetic fields must have a different source other than magnetic charges. And I've said it a few times, the source of the magnetic field is moving electric charges. Like I said earlier on, think of a tap water as the source of, a source of the water field and a sink as the uh, sink of your electric or your water field. So let's discuss the displacement current and the electric field. They both diverge from positive charge, but they converge on negative charge. This implies the following. It says that electric, excuse me, that negative charges, uh, let's say electrons, they will flow against the field. Positive charge like positrons will flow with the field. And this really means that positive charges or like charges, excuse me, uh, repel 
like this, like charges repel, but unlike charges attract. And that's one of the fundamental observations uh, for electromagnetism. Finally then, we're able to relate the force on electric charges and the charges themselves by this equation here. And this is Coulomb's law in action. So we have F is equal to the charge, which the test charge multiplied by the field, where we actually have Coulomb's law written on the right hand side of the left, uh, the left page. So Coulomb's law is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. The product of your charge is divided by the square of the separation. Now, that is an experimental observation. As far as I'm aware, it's not derived, but I, I'd be very surprised if Maxwell's equations don't derive that. In actual fact, Maxwell's equations definitely derive it. <laughs> okay. So now it's time to move on to, uh, to more about magnetization. We saw a moment ago that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero, or that the surface integral of b dot dA is zero, which of course means that we have no magnetic sources or no magnetic charges. Written in terms of the, uh, in, uh, in terms of the displacement field, we have that the displacement current, we have the divergence of d is rho free and closed. Um, I suppose that's just going back and reminding us. But the point here is this. The magnetic field cannot diverge because it is divergenceless. However, it can curl. So what we'll find is that the curl of our magnetic field is non-zero, but the divergence of it is zero. So on the bottom right of your screen, I've just sketched two sorts of fields. The first field we can see is curling. So this is a permitted magnetic field. It's not diverging, it is curling or it is rotating and that is permitted. The field on the right hand side, number two, you can see it's not diverging. It has the same magnitude on, uh, I've only drawn two columns of it I suppose, but it's got the sa same magnitude each time, therefore it is not diverging or converging. So this is a permitted magnetic field. The third of Maxwell's equations is Faraday's law for electromagnetic induction. Mathematically it states that the curl of the electric field is minus the time rate of change of the magnetic field. So what this really is saying is that a changing magnetic field creates a curling or rotating electric field. We can rewrite this of course in integral form. We have the closed line integral of E dot dL is minus the surface integral of del B del T dot dA. Notice really what the right hand side of this particular integral says, it's that it's the, we're, we're integrating along the changing flux. So Michael Faraday had three, uh, three very important experiments back in the day. And what he did was as follows. He created a magnetic field illustrated here by, uh, indicated here by this, um, the, the blue. And then he had a, a, a wire and he was able to measure the uh, current moving through the wire and he pulls the wire through the magnetic field and he noticed that there was a current flowing in it. So that is the first experiment here. So he saw when he pulled or moved a, uh, a wire through a magnetic field or changes, changed the flux he saw an induced electric current. Then what he did was instead of moving the wire he actually moved the source of the field keeping the magnitude the same. So in, this, in the second experiment, he moved the field, and once again he saw that there was an induced electric current. And finally what he did was he kept both the source of the magnetic field and the, uh, the wire stationary, but he changed the magnitude of the magnetic field. And once again he noticed in the third experiment that there was an induced electric field in, or excuse me, induced electric current in the wire. His conclusion, of course, was the mathematical statements you see on, the, see on the top left of your screen, that a changing magnetic field induces an electric current, and or an electric field, and it's, it's more technically correct to say a curling or rotating electric field. An electric field, of course, will drive current, so that's why we were able to measure current. So a changing magnetic field induces an electric field. The electric field drives the electrons, which are the current, and that's what Michael Faraday was able to measure. Before I continue, it would be remiss on my part if I didn't mention the induced EMF. And I'm going to discuss it more in, at a later stage. 
But the mathematical statement here is that the induced EMF, which is given by E, is minus del phi B del T, which means it's minus the time rate of change of the magnetic flux. So that means where the magnetic flux, flux is increasing with respect to time, the EMF is decreasing and vice versa. And you can, well, I have these, I have this equation here that the EMF is the uh, line integral of the force per unit charge dot dl, but the force per unit charge is nothing less than the electric field, so it's e dot dl. And that's something I'm going to discuss later on. Now, it's very important to note that without Faraday's law for electromagnetic induction, mankind has no power stations or generators, and therefore has no electricity. That's exactly how we generate electricity. We change uh, the, the magnetic field and we induce a current. Or really what we talk about is instead of talking about currents, we talk about potentials. And we'll see in a moment that when we talk about potentials, it's the same as about talking about EMF. So when your power station generates 220 volts or whatever it does, it's talking about a potential to uh, a potential to move your electric charge, which is exactly what happens when you plug in uh, uh, a plug into the socket. So moving electric charges create a magnetic field. A time varying magnetic field creates an electric field. And a circulating electric field creates a time varying magnetic field. So we've seen all that. Or you hear it in the, the more common way would be a changing electric field gives rise to a magnetic field. We'll see that later. Or a changing magnetic field gives rise to an electric field. Really, by the way, what we're talking about here is Ampere's law. Now, Originally, an experimental law uh, used to calculate the magnetic field was called the law of Biot and Savart. It's quite difficult to use and can, of course, be derived from Maxwell's equations. Now, I don't really want to talk about the law of Biot and Savart, but it's, it's written here. Now, the point is that the law of Biot and Savart is able to calculate the magnetic field, but realistically, uh, now that we know all about Ma Maxwell's equations, we try and use those in order to calculate the magnitude of the magnetic field. And the very important point is that we can derive it from Maxwell's equations, which is a very important uh, result. And I did that, I think, in video 46 in my tutorials on vector calculus uh, for electromagnetism. I said I would discuss electromotive force or EMF. So in a wire, let's say, there are two forces acting to drive current. So the total force would be the source uh, the source force, let's say if you had a battery, that would be a, a, a source of a force on, on the charges. And you would have electrostatic force. In other words, electrons moving down the wire are all interacting electrostatically together. Where we assume that the time scale is quite, uh, is quite long, so it's, we're not talking about electrodynamics. So if we define a force per unit charge, F divided by Q here, so we define the force per unit charge as a small f, we can say that the total force per unit charge is nothing else but the source force per unit charge, small f sub s, plus the electrostatic field, because we know that f is equal to q times e. Now why is this important? The reason this is important is, let's calculate the work done, the total work done in moving some charge around a wire by the force. So we're talking about the total force here, and we know that in order to calculate it, that's f dot dl, the line integral of f dot dl. I'm going to define the EMF as the, the closed line integral of f dot dl. So it's the total work done in moving a charge around a wire. So I'm going to input instead of f total, I'm going to have the, the, um, the source force per unit charge plus the field. Now, a result from electrostatics is that the curl of the electric field is zero. Rewritten in terms of an integral, we see that the closed line integral of E dot dl is zero. And that's a very important result because it simplifies the whole thing. It means on the top right of your screen that we can rewrite the EMF as the clo clo closed line integral of F sub S dot dl because E is simply going to be zero. Now, for an ideal source, we're going to have no net force. Let's say, for example, there's no resistance in whatever battery we have, or whatever it is, or whatever wire we're using. And that means that the net force is zero by Newton's uh, second law, which
which means that the source force per unit charge is equal to minus the electric field. Calculating the electric potential here, or minus the integral of e dot dl, we're able to see that the natural fact the EMF is nothing less than the potential, where we have a, an ideal source, so we have no uh, we have we have no resistance or no friction or no electric friction, shall we say? So that's why when people talk about EMF, they interchange the the the, the potential or voltage, and that's in the ideal limit where we have we have no resistance to the net force. The final Maxwell equation is Ampere's law. So I've written it mathematically in the top left of your screen. I, I don't think I need to read it out again. Now just looking at the, the uh, differential form in the middle here, when we're talking about magnetostatics or when we have steady currents, we in actual fact don't require the second term, which is mu zero epsilon zero del e del t. That means that Ampere's law for magnetostatics reads the curl of the magnetic field is mu zero times the current density. And that's really what was, that was the first version of Ampere's law and was corrected by Maxwell. Now, the magnetic field will curl around currents. We, we know this already. How do you define the direction which is positive? I said I'd talk about this and we do this by using the right hand rule. So with your right hand, you point your thumb in the direction of the current and you curl your fingers like I've illustrated on the bottom left of your screen. When you do so, you find that the, your fingers point in the direction of positive, uh, the positive field. So in this case, I have illustrated that here. If the current instead was in actual fact going to the left, then you would point your thumb of your right hand to the left, you'd curl your fingers in actual fact, and then you would see that the positive field would be this way. But that's not what we have, so let's just let's put back to where it was. That's how you define a positive uh, current or a positive at uh, the direction of the positive field. So what we use Ampere's law is to calculate the magnetic field without using the law of Bon Savar. The thing is, though, that Maxwell noticed that the steady current expression, which is written on the bottom left of your screen, is in actual fact incorrect and does not work for changing currents or electrodynamics. And in order to fix this, he introduced what's known as the Maxwell correction term, or the displacement current, and that's written on the mid right hand side of your screen. So this is now the differential form of Ampere's law. So we have the curl of B is mu zero J plus mu zero epsilon zero del E del T. Immediately you should see that what we actually have is a time varying electric field giving rise to a changing or curling magnetic field. So a changing electric field gives rise to a magnetic field. And we saw earlier on that a changing magnetic field gives rise to an electric field. So we're talking about electrodynamics. One changing E gives rise to a B and vice versa. Now this displacement current, you might say that's purely a theoretical argument. Does it actually occur? Well. In, in one respect, no, you don't have uh, an actual displacement current. There is no charge associated with a displacement current. But it does, however, resolve the, uh, the charging of a capacitor. We talk about the flow of current through a non-conducting path, such as a capacitor. So no electrons actually flow from plate A to plate B through, through the gap in the middle. What in actual fact we talk about is the flow of the displacement current. So in actual fact, it was um, the idea of capacitors which motivated Maxwell to introduce his displacement current. So I don't really want to get into too much detail in this regard because it very much is a theoretical argument. The point is that a time varying electric field also gives rise to a rotating magnetic field. Bottom line is we have electromagnetism. So to remind us, Maxwell has four equations. Well, they're called Maxwell's equations, but obviously they're, they're really due to other people. The only one Maxwell himself actually had the input on was uh, on Ampere's law. So it's Gauss's law for electric fields, Gauss's law for magnetic fields, Ampere's law, and Faraday's law for electromagnetic induction. Note, by the way, we can write them in differential or integral form by employing Stokes and Green's theorems. 
all other equations in electromagnetic in electro uh, electrodynamics are derived from Maxwell's equations. So if you want to derive the continuity equation, the law of Beo and Savart, Coulomb's law, all of those can be derived directly from Maxwell's equations. The wave equation, uh, the the I will say when you talk about electromagnetic waves, that comes from the wave equation, which came from Maxwell's equations. So these four equations basically are govern all of our um, all of our uh, modern day electronics. Remember, electric charges exist, but magnetic charges do not. A changing electric field, written on the top left, creates a curling magnetic field, and vice versa. We know that Maxwell's displacement current fixed Ampere's law and is required for capacitors. And finally, the wave equation describes both electrodynamics and light, and that comes from Maxwell's equations. So if you're just looking for a hand-waving introduction to Maxwell's equations, that's where I'm going to stop and I'm going to thank you for your attention. For those looking to discuss the, or be um, introduced to the Lorentz and uh, Coulomb gauges and radiation, I'm going to quickly continue. But I do tell you this involves a bit more vector calculus. So let's just look forward. If you want to analyze the field's behavior using their potentials, it, or we, we do want to do that because it simplifies the mathematics. Now we're able to do, introduce the concept of an electric potential or scalar electric potential and a magnetic vector potential using what's known as Helmholtz theorem. And I derived Helmholtz theorem and all of those in my section of vector calculus for electromagnetism. Specifically, we define the electric field as minus the gradient of the scalar potential or the scalar voltage minus the time rate of change of the magnetic vector potential. And we define the magnetic field as the curl of the magnetic vector potential. So I'm sure you've seen that in the past. You mightn't have seen you mightn't have seen this particular term here. But that's required when we get to electrodynamics and is not required in electrostatics. The reason that is is in electrostatics we know that the, the we don't have uh, we don't have this a term at all. It's just not required, and this is the whole thing goes to zero, and we're left with what usually is seen in electrostatics: e is minus minus the gradient of v. So if we plug these two expressions into Maxwell's equations, what results are two equations, and they're written only in terms of the scalar and potential, a scalar and uh, uh, vector fields. And these contain all of the information that's in Maxwell's equations. And they look quite complicated, but I think it is really cool that uh, these, just these two equations, everything, you, every single thing that we do with electrons and light can be derived from these two equations. I think that's really interesting. So where do we go from here? As I've said in the past, just analyzing light and so on involves a lot of vector calculus and a lot of mathematics. It's not very easy, in fact, to apply it to the real world. To simplify this, we use what's known as gauge transformations. So, as I said in the previous page, the electric and magnetic potentials are written there on the top left of your screen. But they're slightly ambiguous. They, they're, they allow us to play with them in a small way because, uh, because of the following reason. In order to calculate the magnetic field, we need to take the curl of the magnetic vector potential. In order to calculate the electric field, we need to take the gradient of the scalar potential, and we also must use the time varying uh, magnetic vector potential. So you might say, well, what? so what? And I'll show you why. Because basically it means that we can add anything as we can add a scalar to our potential our scalar potential, provided that its uh, its gradient is zero. And we can do something similar to the magnetic vector potential, where we can add a vector provided that its uh, curl goes to zero. So on the bottom left of your screen, let's define a new potential. Let's call it A prime. And we say the only difference between A prime and A zero is that we've added a vector alpha, let's call it, to the initial vector potential. We'll do something similar for the scalar potential. We'll say that V prime is going to be the initial potential plus some sort of a scalar, I'm going to call it scalar beta. 
Now let's assume that a prime, the new scalar, excuse, excuse, the, excuse me, the, the, the new vector potential and the old vector potential give rise to the same magnetic field. Let's assume that. In order for that to happen, the curl of this parameter which we added to it, alpha, must be zero. Now, the curl of the gradient is always zero. What that means is we can come up, a new, come up with a new scalar function, I'm going to call it lambda, and we can call alpha the gradient of lambda, because when we take the curl of the gradient, it's going to be zero. So the point is we can add always to the, uh, the vector potential, the gradient of lambda, and we will always have the same. We won't affect the actual magnetic field. So we'll have changed the scalar potential, excuse me, we'll have changed the vector potential, but we won't have changed the magnetic field. Let's do something similar with the electric field and the scalar potential. Let's adjust the scalar potential to V prime and say though that the new scalar potential and the old one give rise to the same electric field. Now look, I'll leave you to, you leave you to it, but what it really boils down to is the saying that the gradient of beta plus del lambda del t is zero. Now, it doesn't take much to get to that. The point is as follows. We have a prime, the new vector potential is the old vector potential plus the gradient of lambda. And the new scalar potential is the old scalar potential minus the time rate of change of lambda. And you might say, well, what, what's the point? Why are we doing all this? I'll tell you now why. The point is, by adjusting our value of lambda, we were able to adjust the value of the divergence of A, which of course gives us our magnetic field later on. And it, it basically makes the calculation of the electric and magnetic fields much, much easier. So by choosing our value of lambda, which allows us to choose the value of A, we speak of different gauges. The two most important gauges are the Coulomb gauge and the Lorentz gauge. In the Coulomb gauge, we choose that the divergence of A is zero. How do we choose the divergence of A to be zero? We choose the divergence of A to be zero by adding the gradient of some function lambda to the vector potential while simultaneously subtracting the time rate of change of lambda from the scalar potential such that we get the divergence of A equal to zero. And that will always give us the same value for the magnetic field and the same value for the electric field but will make the calculation much easier. In a similar way, we're able to choose the divergence of A to be minus mu zero epsilon zero del V del T, and we call that the Lorentz gauge. Finally, I'd just like to give you a hand-waving argument as to why we have radiation. So radiation basically is light. So the fields we measure now, if I want to measure at the electric field due to a certain charge distribution, the one I measure at this point in time depends on the charge distribution in the past because the electric field had to bring the information about the charges to me and it takes a certain amount of time to do that. Noting, of course, that the electromagnetic field travels at the speed of light. So instead of, in, in, we can't talk about the current fields, we must talk about the fields in the past and we talk of the retarded potentials in the retarded fields. So if we talk about retarded potentials, we're able to get basically new Maxwell's equations, and we call them the Jeffermenko's equations. And we, if we plug these retarded potentials into the equations, we get the Lenard v shirt potentials. And I think I've pronounced that correctly. So the point is here, we're no longer talking about the potential now, we're talking about the potential in the past or the retarded potential. And we talk about the Lenart v shirt potentials. They might say, well, so what? I'll get to the point reasonably quickly. By definition, radiation is the electromagnetic power transported from the source to infinity, and it doesn't come back. So that means if we take the closed surface integral of the power, let, and the power is, is, is represented by S, dot dA, so that's getting the total flux of the power through your through a surface off to infinity. If that radiation doesn't if that um that power doesn't come back, it has been radiated away. So as we let the surface area go to infinity, 
provided that this whole expression is non-zero, what's after happening is the source is after radiating away some power. That means that the pointing vector must fall off slower than 1 over r squared, where s is the pointing vector. It's the power per unit area per unit time. And I'll do a video of that uh, later on in the series. Now why must it fall off slower than 1 over r squared? Well, usually we talk about a spherical surface, so dA, dA will have a 4 pi r squared term. So where, let's say, in this case, x is some other part of the pointing vector, but let's say the pointing vector is falling off at r to the 6. So we multiply by our surface area, 4 pi r squared, and we see in actual fact that we still have an r to the 4 under the line, and this whole power, this whole expression is going to go to 0 very quickly goes to zero so quickly that really we don't have any irradiation. No power has been transported to infinity. Let's say instead our pointing vector was x over 4 pi r squared. x is just some other of the other terms in the pointing vector. But let's say it's falling off at 1 over r squared. So when we multiply by the surface area we get 4 pi times x. So the point is as the surface area goes to infinity we see that there is non-zero power after being transported away or after getting a radiation. Where does the radiation come from? Well, we know that the electrostatic field falls off at 1 over, 1 over r squared. That's what Coulomb's law says. We know that the magnetostatic field falls off at 1 over r squared because that's what the law of Beaux and Savart said. So in order to discuss the electromagnetic field, we need to obviously take their product. So we talk about 1 over r to the 4. Well, 1 over r to the 4 is going to fall off really quickly because, like I said a moment ago, we have this r squared term up here. So we're still going to have a, a 1 over r squared term, and it's going to fall off to 0 really quickly. So the point is that electrostatic and magnetostatic fields don't radiate. But, the time-dependent terms from the lienert wieschert retarded potentials fall off much slower. Now, you'll just have to accept that if you plug in for the retarded time into the uh, potentials, you'll get the lienert wieschert potentials, and you'll have a time rate of change of the charge density term, and you'll have a time rate of change of the current density. These are time rates of change, and the two of these terms will basically give rise to a potential terms which fall off at 1 over r. Their product falls off at 1 over r squared. That means the whole thing, when plugged into the pointing vector and taking the limit, it won't fall off to zero really quickly. And instead, we're going to get a non-zero amount of power radiated away. And that's what radiation is. So radiation occurs mathematically because we have to take into account the fact that the information we're after receiving through the field or whatever it is, is due to the charge distribution in the past. So we need to talk about a time, the, the previous time or the retarded time. We plug it into the potentials, we get the retarded potentials. And when we plug those into, Ma into Maxwell's equations, we still have all the other terms which fall off at 1 over r squared or higher. But in the electric uh, component and the ma magnetic component, each have one 1 over r term and their product falls off at 1 over r squared, which leads us to radiation. So this video has been by far and away the longest I've ever recorded, and most likely will stay that way. So I hope I've kept your attention for this length of time. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel. You might also give me a comment in the comment box below. Thank you.